Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Today we're chatting with Victoria Field and Angela Poff, co-founders of the Metabolic Health Summit. MHS is one of our favorite conferences and we cannot wait to get back to it. If you have an interest in the clinical application of metabolic health improvement, you'll absolutely geek out on MHS. We talked a lot about the influence of low-carbon ketogenic diet for neurological health, metabolic health, and more. Victoria and Angela let us in on this incredible resource they've put together. It's a 36-page compendium of the research and advances in ketogenic metabolic therapy for neurological health, cancer, metabolic dysfunction, human optimization, and aging. It's a free download, so grab the link from the show notes. We'd love to have you screenshot your podcast player and tag us on Instagram at healthcoachradio. By the way, the show notes for this episode and all previous episodes of Health Coach Radio can be found at primalhealthcoach.com slash radio. Enrollment is now open for the fall semester of the Primal Health Coach Institute Level 2 Certification Course, an advanced coaching course that teaches you how to create transformational coach-client relationships, which in our mind is the best way to grow your coaching practice. Not only will you learn and practice advanced coaching skills, but this course also satisfies the educational requirements to enable you to sit for the NBC HWC credentialing exam so you can become a board certified health and wellness coach. PHCI has a 100% pass rate for the board exam. Every one of our graduates who've sat the board exam have passed it. Stay tuned to the end of the show to learn more or visit primalhealthcoach.com slash level two. Let's get into today's deep discussion of some of the clinical and practical benefits of an applied low-carb or ketogenic diet with Victoria Field and Angela Poff. All right. I have been looking forward to this conversation for like a year now, ladies. I'm so excited to have you on. Today, we have Angela Poff and we have Victoria Field. Um, I know them and Aaron knows them from the last couple of years at the Metabolic Health Summit. We've been trying to get them on to talk about all the exciting research as far as metabolic therapies, uh, key, key, the ketogenic diet, nutrition, all of this stuff for a long time. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. As thank always, you. we like to start with a little backstory. So I don't know who, it, maybe we'll start with Angela just because you're on my left and whatever. So Angela, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? And then we're going to have Victoria do the same and we'll kick it off from there. Sure. Uh, My name is Angela Poff. Um, I'm a research associate at the University of South Florida. I work at the, in the Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology. I work alongside Dr. Dominic D'Agostino. We, our lab primarily focuses on uh, non-toxic metabolic targeted therapies. Uh, My specialty is cancer, and that's where most of my background is, but our lab also focuses on a, a wide array of neurological diseases as well. Um, In my um, previous research, I've done a lot of work looking at ketogenic diet and exogenous ketones specifically, both in cancer and neurological diseases. So that's kind of a main focus um, of our lab. So that's my role as a scientist. And then on the other side, I also um, am a co-host of Metabolic Health Summit, um, which is a conference that we'll talk about a little bit, I think, in this uh, conversation, and something that's very near and dear to my heart as a a project to provide an evidence-based platform of information to clinicians, uh, researchers, and just anyone who's interested in the field of metabolic therapies. Awesome. Thank you for that. Victoria, share with us a little bit about you, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, I have more of an eclectic background, I like to say. Um, my really, uh, my career actually started in uh, TV news. Uh, I was an NBC affiliate uh, anchor and reporter for some time, have always had a big passion for health and fitness and uh, started actually, uh, my husband and I started several fitness businesses together in Oregon and California. And at the same time, I was uh, competing professionally as an athlete and 
uh, decided to get out of TV news because I was doing too many things at once. That was sort of uh, detrimental to my own health. Didn't really go together. And so uh, really dived full force into the health and sort of wellness space and uh, decided kind of, you know, we were coaching athletes, we were coaching uh, everyday people, but we just really want, I wanted to take it to the next level and um, actually ended up uh, meeting the, uh, became friends with through the fitness industry, uh, the founders of, of Quest who were doing, who were interested in doing cancer research at the time. And they actually had a connection with uh, Dr. Poff and uh, Dominic D'Agostino. And uh, really, I became fascinated with the thought process of, obviously, I've, I've known for a long time, nutrition has such a powerful impact on uh, just how we live out our lives, um, you know, and disease and whatnot. But this was really interesting. This was the first time that I actually found sort of this nutrition approach that, you know, the ketogenic diet that actually could be measured in blood, that was very sort of data driven, which was exciting. And so from there, you know, Angela and I met and uh, it was very obvious that there was just incredible research going on all around the world on ketogenic metabolic therapy in different applications too. It almost sounded like snake oil when you talk about it out loud because it's <laughs> like it, it might work with cancer. It might work with uh, right. you know, traumatic brain injury. There's so many things. And uh, we just said, you know, we, that was around the time where we had to bring people to, together and sort of uh, the, I became involved in the first, uh, the first and second conferences it was, was called the conference on nutritional ketosis and metabolic therapeutics. And it was a scientific <laughs> meeting to start. Um, and it became very evident that we needed to expand that to the general population. In addition to the physicians, the uh, academics, the people on the front lines. And um, that's sort of where Metabolic Health Summit was born. And so, uh, yeah, co-founder of Metabolic Health Initiative, which is sort of the overarching uh, organization to Metabolic Health Summit. So we really have a mission uh, essentially to revolutionize science and medicine by refocusing uh, the public, the medical community, the scientific community's attention on nutrition and metabolism in treating disease and extending our lives. And uh, yeah, we, you know, small, small goal is to change the world one day. So that's kind of a, you know, the eclectic background for you on myself, but a uh, little less traditional, you know, Angela's got such an incredible scientific background and I really feel like the two of us uh, balance each other out very well. So. <laughs> Agreed. Well, your conference is one of our, well, back when we could go to conferences, it's one of our favorite things to do. Lauren, I love that conference. And with the first time we went to it, I was so impressed that it was so research forward. Like it was right. researchers, it was physicians. I don't think we'd seen that in a, in a lot of the conferences we had gone to. I mean, we typically would deploy to maybe nutrition or fitness conferences, but this was, this had a totally different audience, totally different crowd. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty cool to, to feel like you're a part of, something um, that was kind of emerging in, in, the, in the science space. So I want to talk about that, the evidence-based piece, but also yeah. I think it might be a good place to start just for our audience. Um, unfortunately, the ketogenic diet is sometimes still labeled as a fad diet. So I would love to know from you guys how you answer to that when you hear it, inevitably. Yeah, um, I get that a lot, not as much as I used to, right? There's been a huge, you know, explosion in and interest and evidence over the past uh, decade that's really brought it to light in a way that you know recognizes the long history of the ketogenic diet. So um, it's funny because I think most conversation about the ketogenic diet is you know a weight loss tool or something um, that's kind of a more you know general application. But for me, the ketogenic diet is a metabolic therapy, and that's what it's been for a hundred years. So one hundred years ago, this year actually. It's the centennial anniversary of the development of the ketogenic diet um, by clinicians at the Mayo Clinic. And they developed it as a metabolic therapy for epilepsy. Um, so it had been known for a very long time that fasting could suppress seizures. Um, and so the clinicians thought, okay, so obviously fasting is limited by the amount of time that you can do it safely. So how could we mimic what's going on physiologically during a fast and maybe, you know, recapitulate some of these effects. And essentially when you're fasting, you're eating a high fat diet. It's just mm -hmm. coming off of your hips, right? Instead of the food that you eat. And so they developed and designed this diet that was 
you know, almost all fat. This is the classic uh, therapeutic ketogenic diet. So a true four to one ratio of fat to protein and carbohydrate where you're getting 90 plus percent of your calories from fat, hmm. um, enough protein to meet, you know, requirements, and then a very, very minimal amount of carbohydrate. And in the first, I think 17 patients they tested it on, over half of them saw a complete cessation of their seizures. And another quarter had a very significant improvement. And so it was a really incredible success right off the bat. And in the decades that followed, the ketogenic diet has been proven as a very effective treatment for refractory epilepsy. And it's used as a standard of care treatment for patients who do not respond to the anti-epileptic drugs. Um, and so it, there's a, a very long history, especially in the neurological sciences, um, looking at ketosis induced by a ketogenic diet and what that does in that medical setting. So um, it has been, you know, over the past 10 years or so that 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 research has expanded so significantly in many other areas, including, for example, I said I do a lot of research for cancer, but other, you know, seemingly unrelated conditions, a lot of you know, neurodegenerative disorders, mm -hmm. there's a lot of research going on, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, there's active research happening across the board because of the effects that happen in the body in a state of nutritional ketosis. There's a lot of kind of theoretical reasons why this could be a potential preventative, but also treatment in many of these kind of chronic diseases. I love that. I love it. Describing fasting as a high fat diet is like yeah. wild. Yeah. <laughs> It's, I mean, true. Depending, it's true. Depending on the person, right? It, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's true. I yeah. So, um, so I have a question. So An Angela, I heard you say, you know, for clients that don't respond or patients that don't respond to the drugs, you try this yeah. dietary strategy. So I don't know if you want to answer my question or if Victoria wants to chime in here, just based on kind of messaging, is there a reason why in the medical community drugs are first? instead of, hey, let's try this diet. And if that doesn't work, let's try medication. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, I'll just throw out some thoughts. I mean, I, it's complicated, right? So mm -hmm. I know, so in these conditions, again, you know, we're talking about the therapeutic ketogenic diet, which can be very difficult. And right. especially, you know, the history of this therapy is in children. So, and a lot of times also children who have epilepsy might have other, um, uh, comorbidities that have, you know, sensory issues, mm -hmm. autism, for example, will often have um, seizure disorders present. So getting a uh, vulnerable patient population to mm -hmm. switch to um, a restrictive diet can be difficult for a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, for, for some patients, they do very, very well on these anti-epileptic drugs and don't kind of have these negative side effects. Other patients do seem to have side effects and it all kind of depends on that patient and their you know conversation with their neurologist about what their level of tolerance is. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because I think there is kind of this exploding area where both clinicians and patients are looking kind of more at maybe something like this, if it would work. Uh, similarly, they might be more willing to try it as well. But, you know, it, compliance can definitely be an issue with the, ther especially with the therapeutic yeah. version of a ketogenic diet. You know, it's not the kind of classic, oh, I'm going, you know, low carb. And, you know, it, it comes with some uh, difficulty, especially in a clinical setting, for sure. But I mean, to that point, it would be really great to see it continue to be brought up in the conversation upon diagnosis, because sometimes it's unfortunately, even in this day where we know its effects on seizures, it's still not always a part of the conversation. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you do hear stories where parents weren't really given that option. Jim Abrams yeah. of the Charlie Foundation is an exceptional example and tragic example of that where you know, he tried everything for his son, Charlie, drugs, even brain surgery. And it wasn't until after that, that they found the ketogenic diet through unfortunately self-exploration. And then they worked alongside their physicians to implement this therapy that then actually completely stopped Charlie's seizures. And even when he went off the diet, they never came back. So, you know, I think that the work that Jim has done has literally moved this entire 
uh, field forward, to be honest with you. I mean, the advocacy that the, the, he's brought so much attention to the diet, even in hospital settings. I mean, his uh, he works alongside a dietitian, uh, Beth Zupak Kenya, who has uh, literally taught the diet therapy in mm -hmm. numerous hospitals around the world. So things are definitely changing. And uh, you know, I, I do think in more cases than not, uh, you're starting to see the nutrition be sort of a conversation, at least an option, you know, hey, here's drugs, here's this metabolic therapy, it's hard, but you know, you do have support, hopefully in some locations. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest things is compliance. So what's exciting is this space is starting to really evolve to include certain brands and things that are making it easier for people to, right. to follow. I mean, even, even back when I started the diet six, seven years ago, whatever it was, it was like, there was no information. I was sure like maybe my heart was going to explode, but I was like, it's worth exploring. <laughs> even, I, I mean, I'm kidding. But it's honestly, you, you know, you started a diet seven years ago, the high in fat people were like, you're insane. Um, so it's interesting where it's kind of evolved to. And, and I'm thankful for the buzz and sort of the if people see it as a fad, it's definitely not. But that whole buzz around it um, has really, I think, also been very responsible for pushing this whole thing forward. But it just also happens to be heavily backed in science. And I think it's especially exciting to see where the field of epilepsy is going, uh, just in terms of neurological health as a whole, where metabolic therapies play a role. Uh, funny side note, I actually became ex really passionate about this uh, my story involves epilepsy, actually not myself, but my dog. Um, oh. So we had actually, I, it, I know it's a very random side note, but interesting nonetheless, we were doing research with uh, canines um, at a place called Keto Pet Sanctuary, uh, much where we used a lot of the research that uh, Dr. Poff and Dr. D'Agostino, uh, what they were doing in the lab, we said, well, can we apply this to canines who might otherwise be euthanized, have a variety of forms of cancer, mm -hmm. So we rescued dogs with, um, with cancer, put them on this metabolic therapy. And at that same time, my dog had been suffering from seizures that weren't controlled through medication. So she was on Keppra. She was, this was from a traumatic brain injury when she was six months old from a dog bite. And she was having grand mal seizures every week. And there was, we weren't getting any control through, through uh, a variety of medications. And so I said, well, you know, this is, this is working in humans. You know, dogs yeah. are different but still similar in some ways. Why not put her on a ketogenic diet and see what happens? And she's transformed as a dog. She went from having multiple seizures a week on medication to us weaning her off medication. Um, and now she'll have maybe one grand mal once, twice a year, typically. Um, she'll have little focal seizures every now and then, but it has significantly changed her life. And I know, you know, for dog people, that's a big deal, but um, yeah. it is a really great example of sort of the power, for me at least, the power of this therapy and certainly needs to be a, a big part of the conversation, at least an option for, for parents or adults to make that decision. Um, yeah, you know, and that's, that's our that. goal. Right. Sorry, I was just gonna say, yeah, and that's our goal with this, um, with the platform that we try to provide right. with Metabolic Health Summit is educating those healthcare providers to know that this research is there and is available. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of nutrition uh, education in medical school. And so um, sometimes clinicians don't know where to go to find that kind of information. And so we want to, you know, be a resource where that's concerned. So we want these to be part of the conversation initially up front, so the patient can have all options available to them, not something that's an afterthought necessarily. This might be a hard question to answer, but as we're talking about this, I'm thinking in, in the context of health coaching, much of this is well out of our scope of practice. Um, you know, a client's not going to come to us, at least I hope there's not any practicing health coaches who are offering to cure their client's cancer through nutritional strategies. But one of our roles is in sort of case manager advocating with the client in the healthcare space. So, hey, how do you feel about talking to your doctor about this? You know, do you think your doctor is open to exploring this? Why or why not? Would you be interested in finding another doctor? Um, so that's kind of where I think a health coach can come in. If, if a client does come with some very serious health condition, that metabolic condition that could be uh, facilitated through nutrition alongside a doctor. So my question is, Every year you run the Metabolic Health Summit, do you find that, like, I want to know, is it is the echo chamber broadening? 
Like, do you find that you're, you're pulling in clinicians who already believe in it and are like, I, I already believe in this and I want to learn more. Are you finding some more fringe doctors who are like, I've heard about this and I, I'm curious on it and I want to know, like, is, is it widening? I would, I, I mean, I, I'm sure you can speak to this as well, Angela, but I would say, I would say absolutely. I mean, more and more each year we have, you know, while our conference is open to everybody, we do have a significant uh, demographic is physicians who are wanting to learn more. And actually we offer continuing medical education through a partnership that we've had with Cedar sinai And we have a, a post-conference evaluation that sort of goes out and you're actually seeing questions being asked of like, you know, have you learned something that you may be able to implement into your practice, something new? Uh, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. And you're really starting to, I mean, this is, this is something that's anonymous that once we take a look at it, we can't really tell, you know, who's answering what. And so it's been very valuable information to understand that, wow, physicians who might not have known about this before are attending the conference and they're feeling so confident in the evidence-based information that they're gathering that they're actually able to maybe translate or at least communicate that in some capacity uh, where appropriate in a clinical setting with patients. So, I, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Angela, but I would say that's one of my most favorite things is getting that evaluation after the conference and really actually hearing about physicians in the medical community uh, and how that's making a difference. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely um, widening. So I would say, you know, when we were starting out doing some of the work that we did early on ketogenic diet and some of our mouse models of cancer, we were very um, eager to try to collaborate with oncologists in the area and kind of have these conversations, even just, you know, to get together in the same room and talk about this idea. Um, and there was a lot of like, you know, pushback, this was about 10 years ago. Um, and just a lot of like, nah, I don't know, I don't, I don't really think that nutrition matters that much, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I understand, I mean, I guess, you know, probably before I got into this field of research, I wouldn't have necessarily thought that nutrition could impact some of these more serious diseases, right? Because uh, that's just the traditional kind of view in, in, in a lot of uh, medical communities. And so, but that, that was, you know, a decade ago. And, and now in the past few years, you know, those same clinicians that we had been reaching out to are reaching out to us and have invited us to come give lectures, you know, at um, the oncology hospitals and, and things like that. So it's like an incredible um, path, really. It seems like it, it went on like fast forward because things in science kind of move slowly. Um, but it feels like this path we've been on has been just, you know, light speed and, and things have changed dramatically because the research is coming out so quickly mm -hmm. and people are sharing the information and, you know, patients are asking their doctors about it, which is great. That's what we want. We want the conversation to be, you know, two part with you, with a, a patient and their, and their um, clinician. Um, and then they're realizing, wow, I need to get up to speed on this. I, you know, wasn't taught about this in medical school or wherever, and I need to be able to answer these questions uh, for my patients. So yeah, there's been a huge, huge um, widening of that group for sure. It's incredible to see. So yeah. You know, one of the things I would uh, say that to sort of echo Aaron's point, right? It's not our role as health coaches to like hear cancer treat, like we can't yeah. do that. However, one way around, so, you know, we get a lot of people, I get a lot of people that I talk to every single day whose lives have been saved, lives have been transformed. I've lost like a whole person by adopting a ketogenic diet, right? In some cases, a carnivore diet, or maybe just a low carb diet, but, and they want to be able to help others. But I know I can't legally provide quote unquote nutrition advice, you know, depending on where they live and what have you, but there is something to be said for you don't have to go out and prescribe a diet for an individual, but if you put yourself out there as a ketogenic health coach, people are going to come to you seeking advice on a ketogenic diet, blah, blah, blah. You're not prescribing them anything, right? You are a, a resource for these people. And your role as the coach is to help them make that transition into this lifestyle from, especially when they've struggled with it. And here's the other thing that I think where health coaches can be helpful. And I would love to, your opinion because you've, you've qualified several times as all scientists do. This is the therapeutic ketogenic diet, right? There is not necessarily one diet that's going to meet the needs of all people, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So typically speaking, a ketogenic diet for fat loss strictly might be different than someone who's trying to treat cancer 
or what have you there. So, I mean, I guess I'd like some thoughts for both of you because, and I heard Victoria say this, sometimes it does kind of sound like snake oil because <laughs> if we're, we're taking a look at, it can treat cancer, it can treat epilepsy, it can treat Alzheimer's, what about metabolism? Like it's everything. It sounds like the cure-all, which when you do that, it makes it sound like it's a bunch of nonsense. Like it can't possibly be that um, impactful, but yet it is right? It is, but it's not necessarily the exact same formula for every single person and every single condition. So I would love both of you to speak to that a little bit and wherever you feel you can add the most light. Um, yeah, yeah, Angela, where would you like to start? Sure. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the way that I actually view um, ketosis is that it's a very normal part of human physiology. And it was a normal part of human physiology for hundreds of thousands of years until really the past, you know, maybe 10,000 years, if not, you know, very recently, talking the past couple hundred years or hundred mm -hmm. years, honestly, when we dramatically changed our diet and changed the quantity and uh, the amount of times that we eat in a day. And so, I think the way I kind of view this is that ketosis is a is like a side to our physiology that we have in a very short amount of time, evolutionarily speaking, really silenced epigenetically because of this dietary change. And so that's why perhaps it's not surprising that you see such widespread and seemingly unrelated effects. And when we as scientists start looking at, you know, the cellular or tissue level, you start to see the same kind of damage happening in different tissues around the body, things like inflammation and oxidative stress and insulin resistance and hyperglycemia, high blood glucose. These things are all tightly linked to this kind of abnormal physiology that mm -hmm. can be induced with a bad diet. And they are all also things that seem to improve in, in the work that's been done under the context of ketosis. So it seems strange that, you know, people are investigating its potential application in these seemingly disparate areas of health, but on a molecular and tissue based level, these different diseases share a lot of common threads. And I think that that's, that's how I kind of explain why I think, you know, we are seeing, you know, encouraging preliminary evidence um, kind of in these very different areas of health and disease. Yeah, and I, I would totally agree with what obviously Angela is saying in terms of how it's such a normal part of human physiology. And mm -hmm. I think the way I like to kind of bring it down even further is it, I, I look at us all as sort of like hybrid cars. You know, we have the ability to use different fuel sources, mm -hmm. gasoline or, you know, energy, electricity. And uh, it's just that a lot of people, unfortunately, much with the change in our food supply right around, I think, especially like sort of that 1950s mm -hmm. uh, time frame uh, where things started to completely shift. And most of the population never really tapped into this very natural metabolic state. Um, and so I think like to Angela's point, that's why we're seeing uh, such potential benefit there. Um, I think that one of the biggest things is sort of that common thread of inflammation through a variety of diseases, even, even uh, you know, there's certain neurometabolic features of uh, mental illness that are thought to be sort of shared across a variety of, you know, depression, anxiety, things along those lines, um, that the research there is very exciting and still very much in its infancy. But, you know, we're seeing that so many of these diseases have such shared uh, features of them. And much like what Angela said, it comes down to uh, a lot of it, inflammation, oxidative stress, you know, and whatnot. But, um, but I, you bring up a good point about how, you know, you say the word, the ketogenic diet, and it's sort of like blanketed as this like overall term, but it's so different depending on how you look at it, what you're interested in, in doing the diet for. That's why it's so important to work with somebody uh, because I think that, you know, somebody who's just looking for maybe to feel better overall, um, you know, for myself personally, I love it for the sort of the cognitive function and improvement mm -hmm. focus I find. Um, you know, that's very different than maybe working with somebody like a type two diabetic who is on insulin. And you have to be really careful because that can significantly impact things like sort of 
you know, dosing insulin. So it's very important for that person to work with their physician. So I think that's really important to know because I think a lot of people hear keto, 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 but they don't really understand that it has a variety. You can induce ketosis in a variety of ways, right. but also um, it's, it looks very different for, for different people. Yeah. It's so interesting because I've had um, clients and even just acquaintances and people in my life in the last few years say, Hey, what do you know about keto? <laughs> and it's, and I'll they say, don't even hey, know what keto stands for. It's just keto. Right. <laughs> That's my question back. What do you know about keto? Why don't you tell me what you know about keto? Like with yeah. zero judgment, why don't you tell me what you know about keto? Well, it's a high fat diet. That's literally right. the only thing people can say. Right. And so then I'll, I'll then I kind of go into what you, what you were sharing is like, well, first of all, ketosis is a, is a metabolic state. It's not even a diet per se. There's right. a ketogenic diet, but, and helping them understand that this is a metabolic state, kind of like the biologically appropriate diets that are that we talk about for our pets and things like that. Yeah. Um, and I think for folks, it's that just that word has, has really blinded them a little bit. And what's really unfortunate is it's like, it's become just another, I see this in my client practice. It's just another diet that they want to try. Just like they tried Jenny Craig and they tried Weight Watchers and they tried whatever. They're trying keto because they don't understand even what it is. And so I think one of our opportunities as health coaches, if we are working in this sort of lower carb, ketogenic ancestral space is to, is to nurture their understanding of what it is. Yeah, I think that's so important. I mean, that's why we're so passionate about education because it is so heavily backed by science, but there are so few people that actually truly understand the depths of that. Um, and I think it's so important to have people by your side and support support groups to like sort of lead you through what that looks like because it's so much more than just a diet. I don't even like calling it a diet, right. but to be honest with yeah. you, um, ketogenic therapy, I think is, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's not a diet, it's more than a diet. And you can get to the state of ketosis through a variety of ways. And some mm -hmm. of those ways, you know, might work better for some people. It might not even involve food for some people. They don't want to follow a ketogenic diet, but they want to use fasting. So I think it's really helpful that to, to help people understand that it, the end goal is ketosis. Let's talk about the ways to get there. You know, and so that's where education can be really powerful. Probably predominantly in the health coaching space, I'm just going to make an assumption. <clears throat> um, probably more health coaches would be interested in using it for the purpose of fat loss. Mm -hmm. So can we just spend a moment to talk about key, the ketogenic diet for fat loss? So, um, I mean, I, it's interesting because we think about insulin resistance uh, generally there's always that argument like insulin resistant causes obesity. No, no, no. Obesity causes insulin resistance. And it's like, either way, the solution is to drop body fat. <laughs> so can we talk about, can you guys just riff on the ketogenic diet as it pertains to insulin resistance and obesity and, and using it as a fat loss tool for metabolic health? I don't know. Go. <laughs> yeah. Angela, you want to start? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, so, um, these are areas that I would say there's been a lot of research done um, in the past, especially uh, 10 years or so. Um, it's, you know, the ketogenic diet reduces um, carbohydrate intake. Carbohydrate is the macronutrient that provides the most glucose in your blood, right? So when you undoubtedly, when you reduce carbohydrate intake, you tend to reduce blood glucose and that can have effects on hyperinsulinemia or high insulin, right? And so that's why it's been, you know, studied as this tool for both weight loss, but also, you know, insulin resistance as well. And there's certainly research, both um, preclinical pre -clinical and clinical, showing that this a ketogenic diet can be used in an obese insulin resistant population and improve these outcomes, you know, reduce adiposity, reduce body weight, um, improve insulin resistance and, and A1C, hemoglobin A1C and all of these things. There's certainly uh, evidence to show that, um, you know, people will, you know, say and critique and say that, you know, well, we don't have really, really long-term studies and that's, True. There's not really, it's not really, you know, true for like 
any kind of dietary intervention in reality. So, you know, nutrition studies are hard to pull off. First of all, it's hard to get someone to commit to doing something. And unless you're doing, um, you know, long, long term, and then when, unless you're providing everything that the person eats and making sure that's only what they eat, it's also difficult to kind of understand and, and, and monitor compliance where that's concerned. But there are studies, you know, going out two years or more showing these kind of effects. So, you know, I would say that the, there is data out there certainly to support that this is a feasible tool to obtain some of these metrics that a lot of individuals and their clinicians are, are trying to obtain. Again, I don't think it's the only tool um, and the worst, you know, a, a therapy can be incredibly efficacious, but it's not helpful at all if someone's not going to be compliant with it, right? And regardless, there's going to be some set of people who, who are just not interested or not able. And there are people who are not, you know, it's, it, there are certain contraindications to a ketogenic diet. You have certain, you know, disorders of fat metabolism or, or maybe some issues with your liver function and, and other things. There are known um, and absolute contraindications to a ketogenic diet in some patient populations too. So it is, it's not for everyone, but I think of, you know, the ketogenic diet being one tool in this kind of tool chest to reach, um, you know, uh, patients where they're at and, and, and see what they're willing to do and what they're interested in doing and maybe what they're able to do. Um, and, and that is a tool and that's appropriate for some, you know, patients. So there's definitely research out there uh, supporting that this is a viable tool in certain conditions, for sure. Love it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, with what Angela said about sort of, it, it may not work for everybody, but it, it's certainly showing a lot of pro promise, especially yeah. I would say within those who do want to, I mean, that's where you see a lot of the, on social media, like mm -hmm. where the befores and afters and things, it's all around keto. You search the hashtag keto and that's what you're going to find. Um, but what I really love about this sort of nutrition approach is that almost like starting with, you know, if that's sort of the goal and, you know, I, I used to be sort of a, a trainer and coach back in the day, but uh, with the goal of just feeling better, the beautiful thing about this nutrition ap approach is that it has the potential, uh, you know, you can potentially reach that weight loss goal, but there's a slew of things sort of that may happen along the way. And I think one thing that makes this diet so helpful is that some research has shown that it, you know, in terms of like hunger hormones, and I mean, it really has like pretty potentially a pretty profound effect on uh, just the overall metabolic process and cravings and right. the changes that happen over time. Uh, for relationship people, with food, like relationship, relationship with food. Totally. And improves, yeah. totally. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I briefly mentioned some of the research we, we did in, in, in uh, canines, but even what was even more uh, impactful for me was some of the work that we actually did with cancer patients. We developed a a relationship with a variety of oncologists um, at a few different institutions who were interested in implementing that the, this approach with their patients. Um, and you know, weight loss wasn't the goal, but for some of those patients, early staged um, uh, patients, they were happy that it was sort of like a result of that. But I think the biggest thing is that it becomes very empowering for some people because I think it does have a different effect than most nutrition approaches where you feel maybe severely calorically uh, mm -hmm. deprived and, and food doesn't really taste, I mean, fat makes food taste good. So right. I feel like it's a nutrition approach that actually provides a level of empowerment that other approaches don't. And mm -hmm. it's sort of like a, this side effect that is very powerful in reaching that end weight loss goal as well. So um, it's a very interesting, it's very different nutrition approach than, yeah. than right. all the other things out there. And just to summarize that bit, because the anti-inflammatory piece is what makes people feel better because people walking around nebulously feeling not as good as they could. And so whenever I put my clients through like my nutritional program, which is kind of keto adjacent, um, they want the fat loss. And it's like, well, in the meantime, you're going to have more energy, more mental clarity. Your moods are going to be more level. They're going to have a better attitude. Your kids are going to think you're a nicer person. Like there's a million quick wins that are going to happen on our way to fat loss. But unfortunately, diet culture has really massive people's programming. It's like, they're only focused on that outcome. Like I have to get to that scale weight outcome and they're, they're blind to the, some of the process stuff. 
until they feel it. So the, the ability right. to feel that surge of energy and that surge of mental clarity is just like, it, it, it takes folks breath away. It's, I think it's really powerful. Oh yeah. yeah. When you start to experience some of those other benefits, I mean, that's why, you know, I've, I've stuck with personally, this nutrition approach, just how I feel is amazing. So, yeah. You know, we, Erin and I talk all the time about, um, how, when it comes to, from a health coaching perspective, when it comes and you're working with someone who has perhaps several goals, one of which is fat loss or weight loss, that at the end of the day, what we have to arrive at is a nutritional strategy that sends that satiety signal, right? That, you know, stop eating these little bird meals with the plan of having to eat every three hours. Like whoever made that up, I want to punch him in the damn face because it doesn't work. And it keeps us all like constantly thinking about food all the time. Here's the answer to keeping your blood sugar stable. Eat all the freaking time. What? You've got to be kidding me. Like when you look at it now, you just want to like, like face palm, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the benefit of First of all, when you're doing a low carb diet or a ketogen, like for the most part, that's what's going to eliminate all the processed crap, by the way, right? That, that's going to immediately get rid of all that. Not that there aren't low carb processed foods, there are, but for the ones people tend to binge on, they tend to be high in sugar and high in processed carbohydrate. Um, so th- it eliminates that. But the beautiful thing about this type of an approach particularly if we can opt for more of a moderate to higher protein structure rather than low protein, super high fat. Maybe it's not, you know, the cancer approach. It's really more about fat loss and what have you like society signaling. And, yeah, yeah. Right. I can eat twice a day and feel fi- once a day and feel fine, you know, and not feel like <laughs> I have to just dive into, I'm sorry, my little girls like to eat those like dried mangoes. It's like candy for them. And they're always in my pantry. You know, my husband dives for them, but since I never really touch them, I don't get that signal for them anymore. Like not interested, you know, I just think it's tremendous, but also to the point of how a ketogenic diet lowers inflammation, I would love for you to try to, to, if you could address for us and explain to us ketosis in particular and how that lowers inflammation. Yeah. So that that's kind of a, um, a question that's not fully answered, okay. uh, right now, but we do have some insight. So it's probably a multi-part, uh, situation. So one, we know that both hyperglycemia, so high glucose and hyperinsulinemia, high insulin are associated with, and almost certainly induce inflammation. Okay. okay. Um, and so one potential aspect there is that removing, you know, reducing glucose, reducing insulin is going to be lowering that part of the equation as well. We also know that there are multiple signaling effects of the ketone molecules themselves uh, that intersect with the inflammatory pathways in a couple of different areas. So one being through direct um, binding to receptors that are on our cell surfaces that initiate communication within the cell that will dampen an an immune response. There's also evidence showing that the primary ketone body, beta-hydroxybutyrate, can interact directly with and inhibit um, the uh, assembly of something called the inflammasome. And this is something that is part of our innate immune system. It's a, a normal part of our immune system, but it is often overly active in chronic diseases and in and, and a lot of diseases, in fact, and in individuals who have chronic inflammation, you see overactivation of this uh, inflammasome as well. And so it's probably a variety of things. That's mm-hmm. what's so fascinating as a scientist. Um, for me, looking at the reason why ketogenic therapy is working in the cases that it is working, it's because it's a very pleiotropic um Uh, therapy. It's not targeting a single aspect within the body. It's actually influencing literally hundreds or thousands of metabolic pathways simultaneously and also eliciting direct signaling uh, effects through interactions with other proteins, even interactions with the DNA uh, itself. Um, Ketones function as molecules that can cause the DNA to un- unravel in certain areas to um, be able to express things like antioxidant enzymes. So to help boost our cells uh, ability to fight oxidative stress and free radicals. So 
it's extremely complicated, <laughs> um, yeah. but there's several different areas where we see this inter intersection um, with ketosis and inflammation. And this is something, you know, we've known there's been data in humans and in animals for a long time showing kind of a, a blanket lowering of inflammation in a state of ketosis, but we've never really known why. And now we're getting to understand literally the molecular mechanisms at play through some of these signaling effects, which is pretty cool from my perspective. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Absolutely. Because I mean, <clears throat> I have spoken to people again, as, as we said earlier, and I say on every podcast, like my role here at our school is to talk to people who want to be health coaches. And I always start every conversation with why are you here? You know, why are you interested? And inevitably for the vast majority of them, they've had some sort of health transformation. And they talk about how, um, changing what they ate, changing their lifestyle and not always, but more often than not, it's a whole food based approach to nutrition and inevitably in there it's lowering carbohydrate. It might not necessarily be a full on ketogenic diet, but lowering certainly processed food, but carbohydrate. And, you know, I, I talk to people who have overcome like chronic fatigue syndrome, people who have overcome, um, any kind of like chronic, like pain issue, um, just by changing their diet and sleeping better, getting rid of stress, all this other stuff we've had. Uh, I've had a couple people that I've spoken to personally related to cancer. We've interviewed two people on our podcast, both Dr. Al Dannenberg and Martha Kattenborn that both were, um, diagnosed with cancer and used both fasting and their own versions of a ketogenic diet, Dr. Al, more of a carnivore approach when it comes to certainly getting through chemotherapy. So I'd love your thoughts on kind of the use of this diet on multiple cases. And in Dr. Al's, like he was told it's not curable yet. He's got no lesions anymore. Um, and yeah, he's well surpassed his prognosis, which I, I just think is fantastic. So dot, dot, dot. Yes. This can be a fantastic tool for satiety, for overall wellness, for fat loss, but as a health coach, understanding just the broad base and just the real stretch of, of this diet, again, not from the standpoint that you're going to treat people, but if you were to acquire a client who wants to live a healthier diet and um, sorry, live a healthier lifestyle, and they happen to either have it come out of something like cancer or any of these other issues, the role of ketosis is more than just fat loss, right? There's a lot oh, of properties yeah. for ketones in general Absolutely. Um, oh, yeah. and your specialty being cancer. So we, so from both of these people that we interviewed on our podcast for Martha, it was about getting it, getting through chemotherapy without mm -hmm. dying. Right. And for Dr. Al, it literally, he fundamentally feels that as well as his other alternative protocols is what got him into remission. Mm -hmm. So do you have some thoughts there on, what it is about ketosis that can be helpful in both of those scenarios. Yeah, um, that's a, a big Pandora's box a little yeah. bit. But, um, uh, yeah. but you're uh, the I'll, cancer girl, so I find my dad. Depends no, on how but, deep you want to go. I, mean, Angela, I know, Angela I'm like, you go. may have just, yeah, opened up a whole box and I'll be here speaking an hour from now and you guys will be fine and I'm just still rattling off. No, so. it's amazing. If she, she needs to go down a little bit of the rabbit hole with cancer and what she's learned so far, obviously, like there's, it's really important to be very careful about this conversation, I would say, mm -hmm. because um, you know, uh, giving people a false sense of hope is not like, it's important no, right. for us to stick with the evidence, obviously. But, um, I think it's, and as Angela will take a deep dive into it, it's, you know, often talked about with, with cancer, with its sort of glucose lowering effects and that's mm -hmm. sort of what's going on, but it's so much more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Potentially. And I will let Angela <laughs> go a little yeah. bit <laughs> down that rabbit hole. No, that's interesting. Well, and, and I, it's absolutely right. So one thing that I'm very protective of this conversation, because I do think it's not always discussed in a responsible way, um, which makes it harder um, on us who are trying to do the research, trying to have those conversations. Um, cancer is a beast. Cancer mm -hmm. is like the mother of all diseases. The emperor of, of all maladies is a, a book that was written about cancer and rightly so because it is smart <laughs> in a way that um, other diseases you can't really, they're not as complex. So understanding that the research that's available right now on ketogenic diet and cancer is largely in the preclinical realm. So largely coming from animal model systems and cell culture based systems. There are small 
uh, case reports and small human trials, most of them not actually looking at efficacy in terms of improving, you know, tumor, like suppressing tumor growth and improving survival. So if anyone tells you that it is proven the ketogenic diet cures cancer, even proven that it slows cancer in humans, it's not true. That's not evidence-based. What we do know is that there is a very encouraging um, preclinical data showing that in many, many diverse models of different cancer types, the ketogenic diet did slow tumor growth in those animals and did improve and extend longevity. Now, another thing is this is almost never, you know, in humans, it's never been like studied officially in any kind of real clinical trial as a standalone therapy. Mm -hmm. And I would say the data does not support its use as a standalone therapy. So if anything, the preclinical data shows that the ketogenic diet may work the best by enhancing the effects of standard of care. So the best successes in these preclinical models have all been when the ketogenic diet is combined with standard of care therapies like chemotherapy or radiation. And there seems to be something about the metabolic state of ketosis that at least in these particular systems could um, both weaken the tumor's ability to thrive um, and make them more susceptible to the treatment, but also protect the health and vitality of the body, which is pretty incredible. And that was something you kind of mentioned with the idea about fasting through um, chemotherapy and using uh, you know, intermittent fasts or short-term fasts with chemotherapy. There has been some human research showing that, I believe it was done in a, an ovarian cancer patients, um, showing that uh, fasting protocols can be used to reduce chemotherapy toxicity. Um, in those patients, they seem to report less um, adverse effects of the chemotherapy and improved quality of life. There's been a fair number of studies in small human trials showing that a ketogenic diet can uh, improve markers of quality of life in cancer patients. The problem is we just don't have any large, large, any human trials large enough to hint at efficacy. So to actually be able to determine if the ketogenic diet works on the cancer itself, mm -hmm. you have to have much larger trials, much more um, you know, individuals. And those are hard to do. There are yeah. some, you know, in recruitment, there are probably at least, I would say 30 plus clinical trials right now going on on ketogenic diet uh, in cancer and various cancer um, cancers. There's a lot, especially on brain cancer, that's kind of where most of the research has been. Brain cancer, especially glioblastoma multiform is a very um, aggressive cancer and standard of care therapy does not have a very good prognosis at all. And so that's kind of one of those conditions that that's a great you know, place to start because what we have isn't really working. And there's a lot of preclinical research to say this might work. But again, we need more data in humans to actually know. But the why it might work, um, and I won't, you know, I won't keep talking forever. Um, you know, Victoria mentioned, you, you always hear this, you know, oh, it lowers or starves cancer of glucose. Right. Well, as we all know, your, what does your glucose do on a ketogenic diet? It lowers, right? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't like, of course, it doesn't bottom out. You would never want that to happen. That would be <laughs> deadly, right? Do um, self functioning. You, yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, but what we do see, there's some human data that shows on a ketogenic diet, tumors will reduce glucose uptake by maybe like 20%. But if we think of glucose, I kind of view glucose and, and excess glucose as kind of like a gas pedal for cancer. And if cancer has just abundant amounts of glucose, insulin is right there along with it. It drives many, many signaling pathways within the tumor that promote survival, promote proliferation of that of the, the cancer cells. So um, the ability to divide and, and form new copies to grow the tumor and to resist um, apoptosis or resist cell death when uh, the body's trying to take care of the tumor. Um, the, so the glucose insulin story is definitely a piece of it, but there's also data showing that ketones themselves in some cancer models have direct anti-cancer effects mm -hmm. and can induce cell death in certain model systems and prolong survival all on their own. So this probably is also related to kind of what I was talking about with the signaling effects of the ketone molecules themselves. 
they have many different hats <laughs> um, and they interact with the cell in a variety of ways. And we see that they can influence signaling um, in ways that are historically thought to be anti-cancerous. Um, and then there's also data showing that the ketogenic diet in animal models at least may work in part by enhancing anti-tumor immunity. So our immune system is um, typically, you know, capable of dealing with tumors and, and probably all of us have had forming cancers uh, probably several times in our life, but our immune system does something called immunosurveillance, keeps an eye out for that, finds it and neutralizes threat early on. A cancer can only become a problem, become cancerous, um, if the immune system has been shut out of that process. And there's some data showing that in a state of ketosis, at least in this animal model that I'm talking about, um, the immune system was more capable at recognizing and neutralizing the tumor than it was in a non-state of ketosis. So a lot is going on, yeah. um, but uh, there's a lot there for sure. So a very encouraging field of yeah. research. To Go off of what uh, Angela, that was a great deep, brief yeah. deep dive into uh, it at a much deeper level. Um, but to talk about the sort of the implementation side and the quality of life side, I think that's such an important yeah. sort of piece of the conversation. Um, I will say that I had some experience in uh, holding a, actually a pilot study alongside a physician at Cedar sinai that involved GBM patients, glioblastoma. And Unfortunately, in many of those cases, in those patients specifically, they felt very, you know, honestly, like they didn't really have a role in treatment often. And even that treatment, the outcomes or the potential of it working, they were still given sort of this bleak kind of prognosis. And so to be able to provide this group of patients with something that they could do that sort of just as a side effect might lower insulin, might lower inflammation in the body, make them feel a little bit better, that kind of shift for them mm -hmm. provided this quality of life and this mindset that I personally, obviously it's hard to measure, but it, it, it really, I think, helped them at the very least in feeling better about sort of the trajectory of what was kind of next, where you had these people before that felt like they didn't really have a role and felt sort of out of control. It provided them with this, uh, just something they could do and this mental shift that, you know, it's something that obviously the research with sort of mindset and how brain affects body and that connection, mm -hmm. that strong connection is a fascinating area. And actually we've talked about including things like mindfulness and meditation in Metabolic Health Summit because it is such an important piece of the equation and there is some really exciting evidence around that. But I, I do feel like that's an important piece to talk about because yeah. providing some power back to the patient in and of itself might be helpful, so. Big time, yeah, majorly Huge. empowering, yeah. That, and that, that's so interesting because when we had Martha Tetton born on, to Laura's point, she used the ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, purely just to get through chemotherapy without feeling miserable. And that has to, that has to, in a, in a, in a manner of speaking, give you life in making it through the treatment of this terrible disease without feeling all of the downstream um, side effects. She's, she got through it feeling kind of like a badass actually, which you don't hear about that. Wow. Mm -hmm. So good for her. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, that, that, you know, I, it's so hard to say what sort of at play sometimes too, right? Like there's obviously this big change in nutrition, but then there may also be a shift in mindset and there's some interesting research in what that might do physiologically, you know? So I, I yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and you were talking about how this is, you know, mental health month and mm -hmm. that there's a lot of um, evidence now talking about the role of nutrition on mental health, but, you know, and dot, dot, dot neurological conditions as well. Because I, I, I have found too that folks that seem to suffer from a neurological condition also suffer from mental health illness as well. There's got to be something that goes hand in hand with that. Um, and I 100% I think you're right, Victoria. First of all, we all talk about as health coaches, it is our job to help empower our clients. That is our role is to help our clients dig down and find that internal motivation and empowerment that, you know, I am worthy and I can do this. And when you give a client a tool to advocate for themselves, how powerful is that? How could that possibly be a bad thing? 
right? Uh, so I absolutely love that. And um, I would love to speak to a little bit about sort of the, the impact of nutrition and perhaps a ketogenic diet on mental health and what you've noticed. What do you see in the research? Um, what have you noticed anecdotally? Victoria, do you want to start there? Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly an area that I think is still research-wise in its infancy. I mean, this is, yeah. uh, it's exciting to see where the research is headed. I think a lot of researchers are sort of focused on what we mentioned before, sort of those potential neurometabolic commonalities between a variety of illnesses. Um, but I will say, you know, we've had a few uh, psychiatrists who are really talking uh, and bringing this conversation around nutritional psychiatry, which mm -hmm. If you look back, like food was never really a part of the conversation when it came to mental health, but now you're seeing sort of this group of psychiatrists and granted it's, it's you know, you only hear about a handful of them. There's not too right. many and hopefully that's growing, um, but they're actually at least reporting through, you know, case reports or anecdotally that they're seeing some of these patients uh, improve or it, it helping alongside the treatment that they're going through, whether they're on medications. I think that's really important because obviously mental health is very complex and um, there are some things that do require medication and it's so important to work alongside your doctor with that because, um, you know, and as, so there's a couple of physicians specifically that come to mind, Dr. Georgia Ede and Dr. Chris Palmer mm -hmm. that are doing great work that if you're not familiar with their work, go to their websites, um, search because they do have a variety of resources and blogs that are very well referenced. Um, to take a look at what they're doing. And, and uh, actually, Chris Palmer just came out with a uh, paper or two in 2020 uh, covering the topic of uh, ketogenic metabolic therapies and, and mental health. But um, much like what we were talking about earlier, I think that uh, what we eat has such so many, there's so many different things at play as Angela was kind of talking about, I mean, hundreds of thousands of ways yeah. <laughs> that the ketogenic diet might be working. Um, but it is, I mean, I do think there's some, uh, some emerging evidence showing that it may be a potential therapeutic with mental illness. However, it's very sort of preclinical, there's case studies and more work needs to be done, but it's certainly an exciting conversation to have and one that's very important at our conference because mental health is often, you know, in years past, it's often been thought that the head is sort of detached from the body and, and yeah. the two don't work together. But <laughs> what we're finding is that's not really the case. So Angela, if you want to comment a little bit more about some of that research um, yeah, no, that right was, now. That was beautifully done. It's, it's true. Um, yeah, I would say there's a kind of, we, we mentioned earlier, especially when you're looking at especially neurological diseases, you, you really see um, kind of consistent um, molecular changes uh, that are present in, for example, epilepsy, also present in, in other um, neurological conditions, imbalances in neurotransmitters, mm -hmm. um, you know, abnormalities in terms of neuroinflammation. It's a huge common thread. Um, again, oxidative stress glucose hypometabolism. So this is just like a reduced ability of the neurons to take in and utilize glucose. This is something that is very present in, for example, Alzheimer's disease, but it's also seen kind of across the board in neurological conditions. And again, this is something that ketosis has the potential to target all of these different things. And a lot of this is present in some of these, um, uh, mental illnesses, um, everything from kind of more common uh, conditions like depression and anxiety to um, even more rare things like schizophrenia is something that mm -hmm. Dr. Palmer, for example, um, has published a few case reports on uh, very recently with his patients. Um, so, you know, it's, it is, the research is certainly in its infancy, but, but very encouraging and um, the field is growing for sure. Yeah. And speaking to that on the Alzheimer's front, I, I will say not to shift from mental, I mean, it's all sort of right. tied together, right? But um, with Alzheimer's, I think that's some of the most fascinating research too, because it affects so many people and yeah. sort of the common thought or traditional thought is maybe that it's sort of progressive. There's not much you can do, right? Um, but there's a very, uh, just the work of Dr. Dale Bredesen, who was a speaker at our conference. He's also sort of an internationally recognized uh, expert on neurodegenerative disease. Um, and he, if you look at his protocol and what he's doing, he's actually written a couple of books about sort of titled the end of Alzheimer's, if that mm -hmm. tells you anything about his thought process on 
uh, on this ailment, but he, his protocol is largely focused on reversing cognitive de decline through nutrition, through exercise, through fasting, through sleep, through all of these in, sort of environmental um, and may potentially within our control factors. It's fascinating because this is a physician that's got years and years of experience. He's out of uh, UCLA. And uh, to see that kind of shift and to bring in sort of the daily choices that we make as part of the conversation that might, if you look at some of his case, uh, case studies of, of, he actually, in his book, he gives a variety of, of cases mm -hmm. from patients who, you know, and these are patients who are medically supervised and they've got sort of a slew of cognitive tests that they've done previous and, and he's measured them after the fact. And some of these people have actually experienced in, improvement in Alzheimer's, which has been thought to not yeah, uh, improve, it's mm -hmm. progressive. And so that I think, while there's still much work to be done, it does provide this is why we get so excited to do what we do to each year provide this sort of platform that showcases some of this information that, yeah, that we have more work to do, but hey, here's where we're at right now. And I think, I think that's why we've, you know, we put out this sort of this ebook this year where it's like, we have to celebrate all of the, the wins, all of the big and the small, this, it just, we have to have a conversation about it all, make yeah. sure it's evidence-based um, because, and despite the fact that we all had quite the year in 2020, <laughs> there was a lot of progress that was still made. Yeah. So anyway, it's Alzheimer's is another very yeah. fascinating area that is inclusive of ketogenic metabolic therapy and showing some promise. I have to tell you, I, I don't know if it's an aging population thing, but um, like the boomers aging up into, mm -hmm. into old age, but my clients almost, I can't even tell you the percentage of clients I have right now that say I lost my parent to Alzheimer's and I don't want to go down that right. route. Um, and they're, they're seeking health coaching to, uh, to enact some of these, mm -hmm. these nutritional and lifestyle changes that they've heard about. Um, That's so right. it's, it is great. I think it's, you know, I think there's a sense of empowerment there too. Um, because a lot of times we do think our genetic destiny is our destiny. And some of these, you know, we know some of these lifestyle diseases, unfortunately, it's hard pill to swallow are in a sense, self-inflicted. Mm -hmm. And so information and, and support is really where coaches can come in and, and get people excited about kind of, again, re-empowering into their own health. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, right, just I, I'd love to know the the um, the ebook. Is it is it sort of designed for pop like Gen Pop consumption? Uh, if you like to sort of get into the weeds, <laughs> it's mm -hmm. honestly absolutely. Um, so actually, I have it right here. It came from here. <laughs> look at it. No, it doesn't disappear in real life. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, the PDF version is very constant. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it actually is. It's a, it's a year in, you know, for so many, for all of us, 2020 was kind of a bit of a, a hot mess. And it, it, you know, Angela and I had many conversations about sort of what was still happening in the field of ketogenic metabolic therapy. And it was like, I, I think we should highlight what's gone on because even though yeah. it was like sort of this year of ad adversity, a lot of progress was made in the scientific community. And uh, Angela can speak more to this, but maybe because we had a lot of uh, isolation downtime, there was a lot more writing that happened <laughs> in the course of that year. But it, it, this ebook actually, so it, it's broken into uh, neurological health, or, uh, metabolic dysfunction, human optimization and aging, clinical application, as well as cancer. And sort of, it's not all of the research that happened, but it's over a hundred plus research articles wow. where you'll actually find key findings for each. So it's not, you don't have to read the whole paper. You don't have to search on Google. It's literally a one-stop shop where you can see what the key findings were for each uh, research article. And it's also hyperlinked as well. And it's, it's free because, uh, you know, this, if anything, this year came, that came from this year, it just reignited the passion for Angela and I to continue sort of this education behind what's happening in the science of metabolic health and ketogenic metabolic therapy, uh, because we realized we couldn't get together, but people mm -hmm. are still searching for this information, need to know this information. So we've really been sort of shifting gears and focusing on uh, digital education content, because I think even if we can't get together physically this year, that's become very important to us. But Angela can speak a little bit more to some of the deep dives uh, on the ebook specifically, but it's a great resource. Sounds amazing. Yeah, I mean, there there was just a lot that a lot that happened. I would say if you're, if you're interested in the science and just you know check it out because we had a lot of fun writing it and um, 
diving into the literature to really see everything that happened. And I tried to kind of um, highlight articles from as diverse a set of, of conditions as you can imagine. And that'll give you a really good taste for just how widespread the research in this field really is. Everything from spinal cord injury to, you know, diabetes to, I mean, it's just very unique, you know, skin rashes, things like that. It's incredible. So just check it out. And you can see like a lot of, of the work that, that went, went on this past year. I will yeah. say Angela is obviously an, a very knowledgeable, uh, incredible scientist, but she's also amazing at taking very complex topics and produce, putting it together in a way that people can understand. So she did, she wrote the she worked a lot on this thing and <laughs> did a phenomenal job at sort of translating that research, which I think is such an important piece. And especially as a scientist, but I, I do think, you know, it's a challenging piece to be able to explain that science mm -hmm. to the to the lay public. So I, I just have to give you a high five for that, Angela, <laughs> publicly <laughs> that she did a phenomenal work in this ebook. So absolutely. Where So where do people get it? Where can they get their hands yeah. on Yeah. So you can go to our website, metabolichealthsummit.com. And at the top, there's a video sort of resources button there. And if you click on that, you'll actually uh, find the link to uh, be able to, all you, all we're asking for is a, an email to access this and it's completely mm -hmm. free and we'll give you a password to download the PDF so you can reference it whenever you want. Um, we also have a slew of interviews with uh, top experts in metabolic health that are completely free as well that are under that same area. So we're really trying to provide people with, you know, they know they can go to our site and get uh, evidence-backed information on this field um, and both in video and in, you know, sort of uh, digital format, um, book format. If you are a reader or you like to watch things, we've got something for both people. So. so, and tell us, so tell us what's on deck for our metabolic health summit. So you, the goal is to get this, you've got a date set for next year. Yeah. Yes. Awesome. Very, Give us the details excited. for that. Yeah. So unfortunately for 2021, we weren't able to get together just, you know, mm -hmm. COVID um, pandemic, but it's going to be bigger and better in 2022, May 5th through May 8th at the Hilton Santa Barbara Beachfront Resort. So we actually had planned to hold sort of a celebratory uh, event this year, 2021, uh, because it's the 100th year anniversary of the ketogenic diet being created mm. as a metabolic therapy. But we're going to celebrate the 101 year anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's going to be even more amazing. So yeah, we it's um, in Santa Barbara. It's typically four days. We do offer continuing medical education and continuing education units for uh, dietitians, nutrition, you know, you mm -hmm. name it, even, uh, you know, those in the fitness community have come and health coach community have come and applied for uh, using those credits um, for their continuing education. And uh, it's four days of, honestly, it's not your traditional scientific conference. One, we do in include the public because as Angela mentioned, I think it's very important to include include the patients, include the health coaches who are, you know, the people on the front lines who are in the trenches. Um, you know, the medical community is so important to include them. But at the same time, I think a lot of this conversation is coming from the ground up. It's coming right. from people learning about the science and wanting to know more. So uh, it's four days of sort of this, we call it an, an experience. You know, we have about, uh, I would say anywhere from 25 to 35 speakers from around the world who are on the cutting edge of metabolic therapies and metabolic health uh, research that present um, over the course of that time. But we also have like fun networking events that I know yeah. we've been able to, um, you know, share together and uh, a gala dinner that actually benefits a couple of nonprofits in the space that are involved with uh, on the cancer, childhood cancer side and the epilepsy side, actually the Charlie Foundation I mentioned before and Max Love Project. Um, but we really try to bring it from like sort of A to Z. So the entertainment that you'll get there uh, to give you an example, uh, we really were like, how do we showcase metabolic therapy in the real world. And I think you guys were there for that. Did you go to the gala dinner the year yeah. that we built a BMX ramp inside? The <laughs> so we basically, there's a, there's a, um, a pro BMX athlete named Josh Perry, who uh, unfortunately suffered uh, four uh, different brain tumors. And oh he um, went through obviously standard of care and whatnot, but then found the ketogenic diet and actually uses it in combination with his um, treatment and has actually been able to get back to uh, bike riding. And just now he's more of a sort of 
uh, a speaker and, and does some really great work uh, in reaching other people. But, you know, we talked to him, we said, why not uh, maybe try to perform inside the ballroom to really show the potential of metabolic therapy. And so we actually built a 64 foot ramp inside <laughs> our hotel ballroom got out some good liability insurance. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was amazing to see, like, that's what we try to really bring out. Like you get the mm-hmm. intense science, but you also get to see it in action in ways that you won't get anywhere else. Yeah. Um, so that was a pretty powerful, that was probably one of the best nights ever, except for Angela and I didn't eat for like probably 24 hours. We <laughs> unintentionally <laughs> fasted that night. We're like, we I think planned. that all week we were fasted. Oh yeah. We like planned for months for this recipe, this, this beautiful menu. And we didn't eat anything at the <laughs> golf. <laughs> <that night. laughs> right. It was, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. So anyway, yeah, we, yeah. um, tickets are on, on sale already early bird tickets. You can get those, um, on our website and we hope to, we're excited to see you guys there yeah. again. Yeah. Hopefully, we see more of your health health coaches. We had several. It is such a good conference, and I'm not just saying that, but it's like it's it's one of those conferences where you want to go to every session. And so when you're sitting out in the expo hall, manning a booth, it's like (laughs) (laughs) I know. Aaron and I, I want to go to this one. Okay, I want to go to that one. Dang, we both want to go to this one. Okay, you know, maybe we'll just be unattended. No one's going to be at the booth because they're all going to be at the session anyway. So yeah, yeah. it's a set of fun. Yeah, we do have uh, exhibitors as well. Obviously, you guys have been solid partners and we're so thankful for that. Uh, that's how we make the conference possible is, you know, the, the companies and organizations in the space that are actually making this possible and empowering others to help, you know, yeah. through health coaching, uh, through food companies, technologies. I mean, this space is really exciting for who is becoming a part of it mm-hmm. and making it possible for people. So we do have this whole expo hall where you can meet some of the latest and greatest uh brands in this space as well that we've personally uh vetted and and love so yeah thank you guys (laughs) oh my gosh so just you know a little plug aaron and i have been to the the last two and we just walked away thinking what an amazing just group of people not just the speakers the people that actually attend it are very thoughtful people these are people that uh some to your point are clinicians but I was astonished at how many just people from the public that were there because they're trying to take ownership of their own health and they're really curious. And these people can listen to the speakers and understand what's being said, or at least take something away. And here's the best part. It's a small enough event that I literally could walk up and talk to Dr. Seafried and ask him a question about you know, his presentation. And he happily answered. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's the beautiful thing is the collaborate, the networking, the collaboration that comes out of it, not just on the, I mean, on the scientific side, it's really exciting. We actually have a very sort of what's seen traditionally at scientific conferences is a poster session where researchers from around the world um, present sort of in poster fashion abstracts and, and you can actually meet the researchers behind uh, information that's not even published, which is a really, it's probably one of my favorite things. You know, you have a glass of dry form wines and you're walking around talking to people changing the world. That's basically how I view <laughs> that. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a really cool thing, but the collaboration that comes out of it, not just on the academic side, but also the entrepreneurial side, So you see a lot of, you know, whether it's you've got investors walking around or whatever, you also get um, some really interesting industry people too that are looking for partnerships and um, business opportunities too in in the space. So it's a very diverse and and to your point on how everybody is sort of happy, I, I think everybody has ketones on the brain. So that might be a, might be a <laughs> there you go. I'm kidding. I don't know. Who knows? But everybody's uh, in a good, uh, it feels yeah. like there's good vibes. So it's, yeah. we always come off of it very uh, buzzed as well. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, and I think one of the things I really walked away with is to tag back to something Aaron had said earlier about this being a fad diet. And I have repeatedly heard people even today say how there's no evidence for this. That is such, I'm, I'm going to swear, it's bullshit. <laughs> Complete nonsense. There is easily 10 years worth of research that, you know, being done on Angela's this. So, been in it for over yeah, 10 years. <laughs> that's right. And absolutely. And so this little ebook, for those of you uh, coaches listening who are still feeling a little bit of this imposter syndrome and you want to feel as though you're well-versed in this to be able to actually help someone who comes to you and said, hey, I hear about this ketogenic diet. What do you know about it? can you help me, you know, understand this? There's resources abound 
the ebook being one of them, the conference being another one. So I want to thank you both for just all the hard work in making this accessible, because that's the thing with a lot of this research. Most it's not accessible to the average person typically, unless they know where to go or they know somebody. So right. this has made it very, very accessible. So I thank you for that. Well, thank you. Yeah, no, I, on social media, you can find uh, even beyond just the ebook if you're not ready to dive into that. Mm -hmm. Just on social, we really try to take some of the research that's happening and put it into a context that people understand. So we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, would love to connect with people if they have questions, comment on those posts, because we really try to take complex topics and put them into a context that people can digest. Um, I love so, it. Yeah. I love it. And that's what health coaches are supposed to do. So learn from the best. Thanks, guys. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening. Well, if you've been listening at Health Coach Radio, you'll know that we're all about raising the voices of practicing health, fitness, and nutrition coaches, but most importantly, helping to further legitimize this exploding industry. Erin and I have disclosed often that we're on the faculty of the Primal Health Coach Institute, founded by none other than the health and wellness legend, Mark Sisson. And we've interviewed dozens of guests from just about every different health coaching program you can think of, and who practice in just about any conceivable way you can think of. But our allegiance is to the health coaching industry in its totality, first and foremost. It's our desire to continuously and unapologetically lift and promote this industry that nudged us to create this podcast for you in the first place. It's this same yearning that encouraged us to take the educational offering at our health coaching school to the next level. We are so proud to offer the Primal Health Coach Level 2 certification course, which when combined with our primary course, the Primal Health Coach Certification course, not only satisfies the educational requirements to sit for the board exam, but is specifically designed to teach advanced coaching mastery. You will work closely with a small class of peers through this 12-week, very intensive, live online classroom experience to learn how to execute a coaching relationship that is truly transformational. You'll learn and practice how to ask powerful questions, what it means to hold space for your clients, but most importantly, how to actually do it. You'll learn about the craft of motivational interviewing and the nuances of habit change, goal setting, and accountability, and how to nurture your client's own inner knowing, their intuition, and their own self-efficacy so that they will graduate from your care a truly transformed person. You want a big, successful, powerful coaching practice. And maybe you're devouring our episodes looking for the silver bullet that's going to launch your business into the upper echelons. We've said it a million times and we'll say it again. Your coaching skills are what will make or break you and set you apart for success in this field. So if you're looking to level up your coaching skills and maybe dial up your credential and become a board eligible health coach, look no further. You can learn more about PHCI's Level 2 program at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash level 2. But if you would value talking to a real person about your path to being a masterful coach and perhaps a board certified coach, book some time with me personally. You can access my calendar at primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or just call me. You can reach me at 844 307 7662. Thank you for listening to Health Coach Radio, and I hope I get to talk to you soon.